Well, good afternoon, campers. Welcome back to another Friday at 3 live edition. I'm almost feeling semi-normal, so maybe we can go through a whole 30 minutes here. Y'all really send in that many questions. And as you can see, uh, my car is becoming a regular fixture here in the studio. Started out just doing the valve cover gaskets. Then that turned into timing chain and uh, timing chain guides. And then that evolved into you can see that little guy right there, the Vanos, which there are two, they need to be rebuilt. So, you know, ankle bones connected to the knee bone, connect to the hip bone. I mean, I knew, I knew before I even popped the hood on it, it was going to be a lot deeper. I just didn't think I'd have to get out the nitrox to complete this, this uh, project. But at any rate, we're going to answer a few questions here. And then I'm going to continue to work on it so I can get it out of here because eventually Tracy's going to show back up and I think she's going to want it to be somewhere else. Are you not? <laughs> See, Kristen's already sending in a uh, question about the Honda Grom, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, I think we did. Didn't, did that, uh, that contest in guys? If y'all would, uh, chime in as to uh, what's going on with the uh, the Grom giveaway because uh, if we announced it I missed it but for right now let's start on whatever I may have <laughs> may have missed uh, last week I work with a talented slashed slash uh, very interesting group of uh, people the stuff that they post on our Skype channel it's just not suitable suitable for young eyes, but they make they keep it entertaining. All right, let's see. Last week, Caleb had asked me, I have a 2008 TRX 450ER, and my start button doesn't work, so I'm digging it through it. I had no fuse, I had no fuse in the main holders. I put in a 30 amp and the bike started to turn over. It turned over twice and popped fuse. What do I do? Well, it sounds like you're, you're working through it in the correct way. I'm curious. Well, I guess the person that was working on it prior to you <laughs> couldn't figure out what was uh, going on with the fuse situation or the starter situation and uh, gave up. As you can tell, it's raining. So excuse me if they have a little bit of trouble uh, hearing me from it hitting the, uh, the vents up top. But at any rate, um, there's one of two things going on here. One, your starter is getting uh, tired and it's drawing too much amperage. Maybe the bearings are starting to wear out or the the, uh, the actual windings in the motor are starting to short out and it's just drawing too much, too much amperage and blowing the fuse. Or there is a starter reduction gear and a one-way clutch on the, the, uh, the starter goes into. Now, if either one of those two are binding up or going bad, that can cause a problem. But at any rate, I would say go ahead and remove the starter and let's at least make sure there's nothing binding on the inside. And then you can also feel the motor itself on the output shaft and see if it's just extremely, it's going to have some resistance there, but make sure it's, you should be able to turn it by hand, barely. Now, if you can't do that, then that would tell me there's something going on inside of the starter. But at any rate, it's going to be one of the two things more than likely. LMT Adventures had asked me, my Honda Fortrax 250 has clear jets, cleaned, cleaned it a few times and did the spray method as well as the, uh, the light test method to all seem to be super clean, having dipped it, but still only starts in full choke and bogs after a minute, even on choke and revs, but sounds better when spraying fluid in the carb and the bogging begins. Any help is appreciated. All right, it sounds like it's only wanting to operate on your wide open throttle um, circuit, so to speak, because you've got your idle circuit, then you've got your mid range, and then you've got your wide open. And this 250s, that little, that mid range uh, in there, it, those passages are so, so small. It, sometimes it takes a lot to get them blown out. Um, are you absolutely certain that you do have those blown out correctly? I know that there's a couple of vents that come into the, I believe it's the intake side of the Venturi. And those, like I said, they're really small. And if you don't get those cleaned out, it will do what yours is doing. 
So cleaning it out with um, um, the spray cleaner that you would use, uh, you know, the carb cleaner, just in the aerosol can, that's great. But it sounds like maybe you need to use uh, some, some compressed air with some muscle behind it. So I would go to that next and make sure that you, you take care of that second, that, that um, second stage, if you will, or carb circuit. All right. Tanya Penzer had asked me, I just bought a Polaris Razor 800. Great machine. I had an S. The light bar stopped working, radio horn, etc. cetera. Hmm. The lights to the Razor are still working and still driving. It does cut off at idle. Well, what could I check? Please help. Well, it sounds like you're having two separate issues. And it sounds like somebody added a light bar to it. So that's going to be a separate circuit from the, uh, the regular lights, which, you know, every machine had somebody evidently added in this light bar. So that light bar is going to have its own uh, relay, hopefully going to the battery. And then it's also going to have a fuse in line on that as well. So I would head toward that accessory area and see, because it looks like you're that light bar and the radio. Now the horn shouldn't be part of that, but the, uh, the light bar and the radio, they could potentially be on that secondary circuit that I'm talking about that has its own relay. And if memory serves, that's probably going to be in close proximity to your battery, which is going to be under the, uh, the driver's seat. Now, as far as it cutting off at idle, that could be fuel, that could be a throttle position sensor. So I'd need to lead, uh, need to know a little bit more on that, but just taking a wild guess from my seat here, I would say, take a look at the throttle position sensor and make sure it hadn't been knocked out of whack and then uh, either A, replace it, or B, get it readjusted. And I'm pretty sure you have to set that up um, with it unplugged and it's looking for a resistance value with the throttle plates closed. So if you start it up and you unplug the, the throttle position sensor and it doesn't change, well, there you go. This is going to be the, that sensor itself. All right, let's see if we're starting to get some questions over in the chat. Yeah. We'll go ahead and answer a few of these, and if I catch up with you, then I'll jump back over to our uh, the ones I missed last week. How's that? Christian is asking, hello, what, was there a winner announced for the Honda Grom? I'm not sure. I'm hoping somebody in uh, on the staff will pipe up and say yay or nay as to whether or not we've announced the winner of the Grom. Bradley Owens, how's it going, Bradley? Hey, John, it's been a while. Yes, it has uh, since I've been on, backed up for a few weeks in the shop. <laughs> no shortage at my shop. Hope, hope all is well. All is well is here. And um, well, especially in this building, it's awfully quiet because we've, uh, we've moved into our newly renovated building. We were operating out of two buildings in Albany and uh, two 40,000 square foot buildings. And now we've moved into a single 240. And there's been a bit of a learning curve, but Wow, that that place is amazing. Uh, I can't wait till I can share some video of uh, it under operation. Now there was a little bit of a, a learning curve as far as you know, getting everything, everything, all the cylinders hitting on, or getting the engine to hit on all cylinders. But we are there now. So if you're experiencing any delays in getting your product, believe me, we're working on getting it ironed out, and it will make Partzilla and Boats.net better than ever. It's, it's amazing. So the short answer, Bradley, everything is going really well in my world. Jeffrey Cannon, thanks for making the video on rebuilding the Honda Rancher 350. It helped me a lot. Well, Jeffrey, you're, you're very welcome. That is a super popular unit, and the, the one that rebuilt is, well, that's mine. <laughs> that's one of my units. Although my, one of my friends has kind of taken possession of it now. I let him borrow it two years ago, and I haven't seen it since. But that's all right. At least it's getting used. V Y S C X. Ah, you almost got me. <laughs> Hi, John. Are you doing any more videos on, on a 350 Rancher? I need a swing arm bearing replacement tutorial. There isn't a good video on that on uh, on YouTube. I hadn't planned on it, but like like I said, I still own one, and I would bet. And I've replaced the frame on that. 2009 so it probably doesn't need to be worked on again but 
potentially, we could bring it in and do a, a swing arm uh, bearing on it. If not, we could do one on the uh, that Rancher 420, the green one that we have, and it should be really close to the uh, same procedure. Christian Rodriguez, do you recommend pod style old, uh, air filters for a parallel twin two-stroke classic motorcycle. I have a 1967 YM 305cc and cannot find a replacement air filter from uh, at an affordable price. Yeah, I've looked at that before, especially uh, I was looking at potentially doing a, a street racer on a, or a cafe racer type build for a, um, a Goldwing, a, an older 1200. And the trick is with the, the 1200, the air box is dead center, uh, whether it was kind of a mock-up fuel tank and the fuel tank's in the back, but doing the way I'm going to do it, I have to use a real fuel tank and then, well, well where do you put the, uh, the air filter or the air, uh, air box? Well, what I've seen done is that they use the ponds that you're talking about and just right on the very end of the, uh, the intake venturi. Um, the downside is some carburetors, they want that quote, quote, back pressure of the air box around the air filter. Plus the air filters typically has a lot of surface area where these pods, it's really condensed. So your airflow may be a little bit restricted coming into it, but hey, um, a pod air filter is better than nothing. You have to put something on the end of that. And a machine that, that is uh, well, as old as I am, not quite as old, but getting pretty close, <laughs> 1965. Um, that would be, it's, it's a viable alternative. So I wouldn't have a problem with it because, hey, you're having to, you're having to put something on the end of there and then you can't just not have anything. Cohen is asking me, hey, John, I have a YFM 700 Grizzly. And I watched your video of how to replace the stator as I am right now myself. I was wondering if there's a specific type of coolant I need to put in. Uh, I'm a big believer, especially the OEM coolant. Um, Yama, Yama Lube makes the, uh, the coolant for, it's already pre-diluted for all the different Yamaha machines. It doesn't matter if it's a, the Grizzly or a YXZ or a, you know, R1. And it's designed to work in the, uh, very well with the all aluminum, engines and the uh, radiators themselves and it's the one to go with and, and i agree and that's what i usually always run in my machines i would stay away from anything that's automotive you know uh, intended for automotive uses because hey this is not a car that we're dealing with so i would say go with the uh the yamalu brand it's good stuff all right looks like i've caught y'all up in the uh the chat for right now Let's jump back over to any questions I missed last week. I've only got looks like two left. <clears throat> Solomon Garcia had asked me, can a bad stator cause ground on battery to overheat? Just the ground. The the lead is fine. All right. Well, let's let's think about that for a minute. Um, your stator, it can be single phase or three phase. On the larger machine, it's going to be three phase. So you've got just basically three wires coming out of the stator and they're going into what? Your, your voltage regulator and rectifier. Now, if one of those is going to ground or is shorted out in the windings in the stator, is that gonna ground out your, your ground wire going to the battery? Hmm. That would be sending AC voltage to ground. And is it possible for it to go back up through the, uh, the ground wire? My intuition would say no. I think it is just it is going to take the shortest path to get to ground, and it's not going to be going back to the battery. It's going to the frame of the motorcycle itself. So my bet would be that uh, you've got something else going on with your your battery ground wire. I would be suspect of its um, of its connection. But um, beyond that, what could make it overheat? If your stator or your voltage regulator rectifier was um, malfunctioning and overcharging your battery, that I could see that overloading the ground potentially. Because if you're sending 17 to 18 volts over on the plus side, 
you're talking about the voltage from the ground to the positive of the uh, the battery. So I can see that as making the, the ground overheat. I would look at the connection, check your voltage output on the uh, on the back uh, of your regulator rectifier first, and then make sure your ground is good to go as far as the connection, because uh, a bad ground or a bad connection on your ground that would allow your resistance to, to go up. And then that does what? Well, increases your amperage. So that could happen as well. Mark G has asked me, hi, can anyone help? I don't know. We'll find out. My 08 GSXR 1000 starts fine, but when I throttle it, it is lacking in power. What, <coughs> what might be causing that? Spark plugs, fuel injectors, fuel pump, what? Well, I may be able to help you on this, Mark, because if you're saying that it'll, it'll idle fine, you're going up through the throttle range, and then at, at about maybe 6,000 RPM or maybe 5,500 RPMs, starts to fall off and you can't get it to rev out anymore. I've run into that um, on our 07. And what it turned out to be is you have two set or two fuel injectors per cylinder. So you have a total of eight of these things eight of these things. You've got four on the what they call the low RPM side, and then you've got four more on the high RPM. Now, for my particular application, somebody did some creative wiring in that area, and the common ground for the upper end or for the top four fuel injectors, they had extended it with, I, don't know, I can't even explain it, but it was a wire about this long and it was had you know zip tie not zip ties those wire nuts i mean it was just a damn mess it, it had been hacked on so at any rate it wasn't grounded properly for those upper four injectors to um to activate as their as they should um once i straightened out that everything everything cleaned up as far as uh, its ability to rev on out so i would look at your upper rpm uh, fuel injectors because Chances are that's what it is. Other thing you want to check is your um, your full your fuel pump. You should have around fifty four psi um, at the uh, at the output of it. But uh, I would definitely look at those secondary injectors first because I, I chased my tail on that one for a while. Um, but once once I started digging into that harness that it had been hacked on, there it was. So take a peek at that and let us know. All right, I've caught you on questions from last week. Do we have anything else for this uh, for today? All right, I think we left off with Cohen, and now we're over to David Hernandez Lopez. My 1986 LT50 Suzuki it, is the nut on the clutch a right hand thread or left hand thread? Whew. All right, which, uh, you're talking about the, the clutch basket itself, that main ball snut that's holding on the, uh, uh, the inside of the clutch. I would think that's a standard. I've never run up on one that was reverse thread. But that being said, I can't recall ever working on an 86 LT50 Suzuki. But if Hank would like to make a note of that, I have no problem looking back in the, uh, in the, the manuals online and, uh, making sure of that. So Hank, if you would uh, note David's question and I'll do a little bit of research for him. Arvind Gard, huh, interesting. I have a 2007 TRX 450R and I can't tell if my engine fan is coming on anymore. Hmm. How would I test it? It worked at one time, but in recent hot rides, I just haven't noticed it being on. All right, well, a couple of different ways you can do static tests. It is just an electric uh, DC motor. You can unplug the connection and just use a couple of jumpers off the battery to make sure it's working. Now, is that going to be the definitive test? No, but that'll tell you if the fan motor is working itself. Now, you're going to have to look into the rest of the circuit to make sure that it's getting power to the, the thermistor, which is basically a, a, a switch, if you will, on the um, radiator when it hits a certain temp. Closes that connection, sends power up to the uh, the the, uh, the fan itself. I'm trying to remember the machine that we did a um, a rundown on as far as how that circuit works. 
I think it was on the uh, the YFM 700, our Grizzly 700. So, um, Hank, if you recall that one, if you drop a, a link to it, um, the, the circuits are based, I know it's a Honda versus a um, Yamaha, but uh, it, the, the circuit should be set up close to the same way as far as the testing procedure. Kim Little. Hi, John. I have a 2004 Yamaha 660 Grizzly. Can you tell me how to test the reverse switch? Uh, I get an open condition either way, plunger out or in. Well, I think you just nailed it. I mean, to test a switch, all it's doing is um, sending a, uh, a, a, a sending a ground uh, on the inside when it gets connected because it's just that single wire uh, or that connection point on the, uh, the side of the engine. Um, you can test that a couple of different ways. You could actually use just a test light and uh, connect your alligator clip to your positive post on your battery, take the probe, put it down to the end of the uh, reverse switch, and then put it in neutral, then put it in reverse. The light, the light should change states one way or the other. I would imagine it's off and then it should be on. JG, um, thank you for all the work you do with uh, your live chats and, and your library videos from J. JG in England, UK. Well, well thank you very much. Uh, we enjoy what we do here, and uh, I, I have a I have a fun job. But it it's uh, it's nice to hear back that uh, we truly do help out folks. And you know, I started doing this live thing just because I was quarantined a couple of years ago at home, and I was like, well, shoot, let's do something. And uh, we just kept doing it. So if y'all want me to, we will continue to uh, to do so. When time in my oh so busy schedule allows. <laughs> um, Arvin Grog, thank you. You are very welcome. Frederick Moses, hi John. I have a 2001 Yamaha Blaster 200. I'm having problems getting the carb to, to idle. Uh, do you have any tips? Huh. All right. Well, what are you doing to adjust it? Would be my my question, Frederick. Because if you're just increasing your um the the idle screw you're probably getting into that mid-range circuit i was talking about before and that would tell me that your um uh, the low the idle circuit is probably stopped up so it may be time to pull the carburetor off and go through a, a cleaning procedure and it, it'll be very similar to you know all the other carbs that i've cleaned on just about any of our videos as long as as long as it's a machine of, of about the same um, CC displacement. I'm pretty sure we did a clean on the, uh, the Rancher 350. Um, and you could follow that one through as, uh, as to what you're looking for. Because especially on the smaller or the idle circuits, it doesn't take much to stop those up. And I, I will bet that that's probably what's happening to yours. David Hernandez Lopez, where would I find an online manual for the LT50? I've tried looking around, but I can't seem to find one. Yeah, that's that 1987, 1986 one. That's going back. I won't know until I go take a look at uh, the uh, Suzuki website to see uh, if they go back that far. You may have to resort to like a climber manual, C L I M E R or C-L-Y-M-E-R. Um, you may have to go with one of those instead. But I'll take a peek um, when we finish up here before next week, hopefully, and uh, see if there's anything out there on the, uh, the LT50. All right, Johnny Jixer, how do you pressurize a water pump to see if the seal is bad? Oh, on a 2004 Jixer 100 or 1000. I've never tried to pressurize one before because typically when you get down to the water pump and you can see if, uh, if it's actually exchanging water for um, oil, which is when a, a seal usually um, uh, fails and that, that's the telltale sign. But as far as pressurizing one, I've never tried that before. So I don't, I don't have a, an answer for you, Johnny. But I won't mind you know poking around in the manual, see if there is a uh, Suzuki prescribed way to uh, pressure test it. Interesting. Uh, that would make sense to do it. JG sent another question. Uh, my son is buying a V65 VF1100 Honda. It's been turned into a trike, 
instead for a year, you know, and issues to look out, look out for with those bikes. Well, the biggest thing is, well, you said it, it's going to be, it has been sitting for a year. So be very thorough before you take it out on the road, because if it's been sitting for a year, how old are those tires? How old is the fuel in there? in the tank. I imagine it's going to be a mess more than likely, especially if, if y'all have uh, ethanol fuel in England, which I'm betting you probably do because that makes a mess out of it. I, I think we did a, uh, I know we did a video on what to look for when you're buying a used bike and uh, things you need to address immediately. Uh, if you would check our playlist, uh, of course, on the, on the YouTube channel, and I can give you some pointers. Uh, in-depth pointers of what to look for and what to be leery of on a used machine. Paul Gravinsky, how's it going, Paul? You keeping the world running up uh, in North Georgia? Just arrived, John. Question about my 20-year-old Grizzly. I watched your video on the newer Grizzly where you replaced the clutch. Was the, the was there a reason for that rebuild? Was it making noise or anything? Honestly, it, was, it wasn't, um, Paul. A lot of the videos that I do is, is on machines that are actually just fine. And I'm basically taking taking something apart and replacing parts that sometimes more than not don't need to be replaced. I mean, I'll, I'll look for the telltale signs of things that are starting to go wrong, you know, just from a, a piece like a clutch that's been through some use but is not useless. But I, I extrapolate, you know, if, you, if these grooves are really deep or if these if these um, centrifugal clutches are worn down to the metal, well, then you know you've got to do something. But uh, was there anything uh, wrong with the ones that are the ones that I replaced in the in our seven seven hundred? No, there wasn't. So sorry, Kim Little. Thanks, John. The reason for the question: no part light and no crank in part, only neutral. Did I miss you, Kim? Oh. Okay, that was the 660 Grizzly. Can you tell me how to test the uh, reverse switch? Ah, gotcha. The reason for the question, no park light and no crank in the park light neutral one. Yeah, that would do it if it thinks it's in reverse. There you go. Um, you should be able to unplug it uh, just at that connection on the side of the engine. I think it's just a bullet connection. And if you unplug it, then it should should tell it, okay, everything's fine. And then it should start. Um, Paul said, I can feel something hitting the plastic on mine. JP Morgan Chase, wonder what they want to uh, sell me. This is fun. This is John. <laughs> Hello. Nice reverb. Hello. Uh, yeah. Hello. This is for a hoop. All right. I think this is actually a real, real call. Hold on just a minute and I'll be with you. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and sign off and then uh, we will continue this next week. You'll have a great weekend, a great week, and we will speak then. Thanks. Okay. What you got?